Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. I want to go right to the scriptures today. I want to go to the book of Jude because uh, people send me things every week. They say, Pastor Mike, take a look at this video. Pastor Mike, look at this article here. Pastor Mike, do this. And what's going on in the world is that there are watchers everywhere. There are people who are watching what's going on in the world. They're concerned about things that they see. They're concerned about things that their family members are a part of. And I want us to go to Jude and look at how Jude described, or why he described, we should be concerned. In Jude's letter, he says in, in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave... By the way, the book of Jude only has one chapter. So the verse 3 here. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, I, I want to stop right here. The common salvation, what that term means is that everybody who is going to be saved is saved all the, the, the same way. In other words, there's not one way for one group over here and another way for another group over here. Not all the, not all the worships and not, not all the uh, religions lead to the same God unless, of course, that God happens to be Lucifer, which, of course, he wouldn't save anybody anyway. He would just condemn them to hell. But there is a common salvation, a salvation. This, the way that I got saved is the way that you got saved, the way somebody over here needs to be saved. There is one way to eternal life, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. To write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, means sincerely, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The same faith that existed in Jude's day, the same faith that existed in the New Testament times is the same faith that should exist right now. The same, the same Bible that existed back then is the same Bible that should exist now because he talks about faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word faith here means that the same Bible that was around in Jude's day is the same one that is around today. It's still the word of God. It is still inerrant. It is still perfect. It is still the incorruptible seed. We're going to get to that in a little bit. To earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he said, we need to contend for this. Now I, that word contend, I don't like contentions. I don't like fights between people. It always makes me nervous. Um, I don't like being at odds with somebody and I don't like confronting people. That, that sort of scares me a little. I'm, I have this little weak nature in me. Uh, I'm a little bit of a sissy. But it not... A bad sissy, just a little bit. Um, but I, I don't like contending except for when it comes to the Bible. The faith that was given me, the trust that I have in my God and who Jesus is. Then we should be earnestly contending for that faith. Why? Because number one, if the wrong kind of faith, let's say that let's say the devil has a gospel. A, a sort of like the anti-gospel, which would be the bad news and not the good news. Let's say the, the devil has another gospel, and he does. Should that gospel be allowed to go out into all the world and be preached? Absolutely not. We should stand up against that and say, hey, this stops right here. This false gospel now moves into the churches. You don't believe that? I'm going to read the next verse here in a minute. That false gospel moves into the churches, and pastors start believing it. Pastors who have attended seminary and have attended Bible college, and have listened to the, the scholars and the critics and the Bible doubt casters for four, sometimes six, maybe even eight years, those doctors of divinity who now stand in the pulpits of America and all over the world. And the faith that they grew up on is not the same faith now that they're preaching out of the pulpits. It needs to be contended. It needs to be stood Against, Because he says in verse 4 that it's in the churches. How did it get in there? Certain men crept in unawares. Certain men crept in unawares. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Here it is. Certain men come in. Uh, they take the grace of God. The faith. The gospel. The good news. They take the grace of God and they turn it into something that just, I don't know, just doesn't look right. 
doesn't sound right. If you, if you know the Bible and you believe the Bible and you trust in Jesus, when you see some things going on in the church, you go, that just doesn't look right. I, I can't tell you the number of people that have written, called this ministry, uh, gotten in contact this was somehow, some way, and said, Pastor Mike, we're at a church, got a new pastor. All of a sudden, things are changing. We don't know exactly what it is, but it just it doesn't sound right to us. It just doesn't. It just doesn't seem right to us. What they're doing is they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We see fornication. We see adultery. We see even sodomy moving into the churches. But that's not near as bad as this idea that's floating in there. You know, all these churches doing all these um, marital sermons, putting big billboards up everywhere, advertising that they're doing these marital sermons seminars and sermons on Sunday morning just to draw a crowd. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and deny, listen to this now, here it is. They are denying the only, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to read you a verse in a little bit that Paul talked about, but somebody sent me a video that when I, when I heard what was being said, I went, wow, there's another Jesus right there. When I saw, and you know me, when I saw the symbol in the background, I knew which Jesus it was. It was real simple for me to discern which Jesus this man was referring to. The man in question is a man by the name of Mike Bickle. Mike Bickle is part of the IHOP, International House of Pancakes. No, 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 not the International House of Pancakes. International House of Prayer. I think I would have probably named my church something besides that. Uh, maybe Mac Bethel's or something like that. Uh, but anyway, IHOP, the International House of Prayer. They're related, first cousins, maybe even brothers, to the Kansas City Prophets, um, which is related to um, um, uh, Joel's army. You remember our teaching about Joel's army. Let me, let me just cover this very quickly for you. Let's go to the book of Joel. Because Joel's army, this concept keeps uh, creeping up. Certain men crept in unawares. There's a group of these people, the Kansas City Prophets, the IHOP crowd, and there are others that are linked in with this. Todd Bentley and uh, all of his crowd is linked into this. And God warns, God actually tells and prophesies of an army in the book of Joel. And some of these people, in fact, they're all saying, oh yeah, that's us. We're Joel's army. We're going to be the super Christians. We're going to take over the world for Jesus Christ. We're going to have like superpowers and nobody's going to be able to defeat us. And one of these days, a paradigm shift is going to happen. A change is going to take place. God is doing this new thing. Of course, it's not really in the Bible because he gave it to us in, uh, in all these uh, prophets' dreams and visions. That, that's how we know that it's from God. Um, but they talk about a, a new army that's, that's mentioned in the book of Joel. And they say, we're, we're that army. We're going to be the new breed, a new generation of super mighty Christians who have special powers to take over the world. And they compare themselves with this army. The interesting thing, this army in the book of Joel is compared to, uh, uh, to locusts in Joel chapter 1 verse 4. He's compared to uh, um, their, their teeth is like the lion. Uh, they're compared to uh, uh, chariots and the sound of horses and devouring and fire. They're, they're compared to all of that. That's the description of Joel's army given in Joel chapter 1 and 2. But when I look in Revelation chapter 9... Actually, when I look anywhere else in the scriptures for a description that God's people are going to have the cheek teeth of a lion and that we're going to be compared to locusts and this, I don't see that anywhere. What I see in Revelation chapter 9 is God's judgment being poured out on the earth. God actually has an army. Did you know that Pharaoh and all of his chariots were actually under the control of God? Go read, go read uh, Exodus chapter 14. You'll see that they were actually under the control of God. Because God stirred up Pharaoh's heart and he took, he took all of his chariots and his horses. Okay, He took all of his chariots and his horses and he went out to get Israel. But actually God stopped him just before he got there. Which meant that Israel was now trapped between Pharaoh and the Red Sea. 
And God led Israel there. So here God led Israel into a trap. And then he brought Pharaoh over here and put him right there. So here is Pharaoh here and here's the Red Sea here. And Israel is going, uh, what do we do now, Moses? And they cried unto the Lord and God saved them. See, God not only was in charge of Pharaoh and his chariots and horses, he was in charge of the Red Sea as well. I, I like God. I like what he's in charge of. Um, the poor Joel's army crowd doesn't think God's in charge of anything right now. They think that they've put us in charge, which is not right. But the Joel's army that's described in the book of Joel, we've covered this several times, is actually described almost exactly the same in Revelation chapter 9. A star falls from heaven. I think I know who that is. And he's been given a key. And he opens the, the portal, the gateway. Okay, um, A new thing is going to take place. He opens the portal. And the Bible describes, oh, look, look there, verse 3, and locusts, locusts coming out. Okay, Devils. Devils that look like locusts. And they also look like scorpions. And um, they also uh, have the shape of horses, and uh, they have the sound of chariots. And oh, look here in verse 8, their, their teeth is like the teeth of lions. That's exactly what Joel described. So the Joel's army crowd, well, maybe they are the army of God, just not the good one. Okay, That army of God, this evil, wicked, from hell army, is designed to chase God's people back to God. When we see things like this going on, it should, not, it should renew our faith and our trust in this book and say, God, I don't want to be a part of that. I want you to make me whole again. I want you to make me right. And so do a little comparing if you want to. But here's, here's what really gets me. This is, uh, uh, this is Mike Bickle. This is a form of worship. I'm going to show you a clip of a video. This is a form of worship they call harp and, and bowl worship. Now, I, I, there's something not right about that, and I don't know exactly what it is yet. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. But here's a clip of, uh, of the harp and bowl worship. It, it involves a lot, of, uh, a lot of drums and a lot of guitars, a lot of moaning, uh, a lot of sighing and crying, and it, it involves a lot. But then, but then Mike Bickle, he's going to prophesy now. And I want you to listen. You're going to catch this now. I want you to listen to him. Here's what he's going to say. In fact, I'll, I'll let you listen to it first. Then I'll tell you what he said. Take a listen. will be angry at me when I show my power, when I confront the oppressors of the earth in my righteousness and in my judgment, they will rise up in anger. And even many of my people, they will be offended and they will take a step back and they will say, this is not the Jesus that I know, but they do not know me. As a bridegroom, in love, I will confront everything that hinders love. Will you stand with me? Will you trust my leadership? Will you open your heart to me? In the name of Jesus, do not be offended at my way, says the Lord. All right, here, here's what he said. I don't know if you caught this. Here's what he said. This is Mike Bickle at the International House of Pancakes. Oh, excuse me, prayer. Um, he says, many of my people, they will be offended, and they will take a step back, and they will say, this is not the Jesus that I know. 
I, I, I don't know if you catch that or not. You see, here, here's what, here's what, the, the, here's what they, they do. The, the IHOP crowd, Mike Bickle, the new Kansas City Prophets, the Joel's Army Group, all of the, uh, all the false preachers. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, I've heard him do this a dozen times. He'll, he'll want to set people up for a false doctrine, and then he'll, he'll do it by saying, now, don't let your tradition trip you up on this. You know what he's saying? Forget everything you've read in the Bible about the gospel and about Jesus and about the Holy Ghost because God told me some new thing that I'm going to share with you. That's, that's how they do it. And here's Mike Bickle saying uh, that everybody's going to say, um, this is not the Jesus that I know. And what he's saying is, we have the real Jesus, and it's not the one of the Bible, it's not the one of the traditional churches, it's not the one of orthodoxy, it's not the one that everybody saw t- you know, 2,000 years ago. We, we, have a, we have a different Jesus. It's not the one that everybody knows. It's, it's a different one. That's what he said. They will step back and they will say, this is not the Jesus I know let's go now before i get to the scripture i want us to i want to show you this this was actually the symbol that was in the background this whole time in this video okay um boy take a look at that what is that what is that boy you, oh man you're going to see something here in a little bit i want you to notice it, it, i guess it kind of looks maybe like a candle uh but then it's got this head on it it's got this weird shaped head on it um it's it it sort of looks like uh you know, you know how they praise and worship you know they all stick their hands out like this and they go okay um it's actually the symbol of it's a it's a form of the symbol of the skull and crossbones it is what it is okay now the little candle flame on top of that um i'm going to show you a graphic of a a, a computer company that specializes in um, dictation software. It's it's called Dragon Naturally Speaking. I'm going to compare this candle flame with their logo. You, I, I see something here. Okay, I, I see something. But but let's let's not stop there. Let's go back to this this symbol here. The, it, it looks like this man, uh, you know, that you see all over the place, uh, hands and arms stretched out, and, and a, some kind of symbol at the top. That's that's the skull and crossbones. Last week's broadcast, we talked about vitriol. We talked about the Masonic uh, meditation room where they go in and there's this candle lit and there's this old book and a bunch of other stuff. And then there is a skull and crossbones there. The skull and the crossbones symbol has everything. Uh, the Manley Hall, we've, we've talked about this in several things. Manley Hall describes the, the skull and the crossbones or the, the pentagram because it has five points. He said the crossbones represent the four elements, which actually is your X chromosomes where your DNA is stored. Remember, your DNA has four base pairs. Those are the four elements. But then there's, I want you to get this, then there is a fifth element that is hiding within those four. It's deep down within those four. And that fifth element is going to rise up out of the other four And it's always picturized by the symbol of the skull. The skull in the Bible is a picture of the Antichrist. Where was Jesus crucified? Remember Sisera. He had a nail driven in his skull. And here is Christ on the place of the skull, Golgotha, and the cross being fastened as a nail in a sure place. I love this. I love the symbolism here. But that's what you see with this. There Jesus is like the skull and crossbones Jesus. Now, all the time growing up, when I saw uh, something on the shelf that had a skull and crossbones on it, that meant like danger, don't drink this, don't eat, this is poison. I think it still means that. The skull and crossbones has everything to do with the Antichrist who is not the Christ. He is another Jesus. And Paul warned us about this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you, With godly jealousy, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. There's like the opposite of the lasciviousness that Jude said they're turning everything into, they're turning the grace of God into. He says, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, here it is, another 
Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear well with him. And Paul is saying, you know, here I've preached, uh, I've, I've worked hard trying to preach you the true gospel so that you can be presented to Christ as his chaste bride, clean. But he said, somebody else that, that comes along with different things, they'll come with a different gospel, and you'll go, ooh, I like that gospel, because that gospel I can like, you know, do whatever I want to and still go to heaven, um, or another spirit, and you say, ooh, I like that, ooh, that spirit makes me feel good all over, oh, I just feel this ecstasy, I feel Jesus, I'm in love with Jesus. That's like the lascivious Jesus that they're warning about. He says, then they'll bring you an, another Jesus. It's not the Jesus of here. It's a, it's a carved out Jesus. It's a fake one. It's one that instead of giving you life, it brings death. And Paul said, yeah, I'm afraid to say, but somebody else comes bringing you the other Jesus and the other gospel, and the other spirit. You'll probably go along with that. And this video, one of the things that really stood out in my mind, if you watch, you know, Bethel Church on the internet and you watch our services, uh, you'll see people scattered around in a, in a normal, traditional church setting. That's what we like. You look at videos like this and you go to the Todd Bentley concerts and you go to the Joyce Myers meetings, you go to everywhere. There's people everywhere. They're stacked up like cordwood. I mean, there's people flocking. The Bible says many shall follow their pernicious ways. And my goodness, broad definitely is the road that leadeth to destruction. And there's a lot of people on that road. A lot of people showing up for stuff like this. And a lot of people are saying, you know what? We like the other Jesus better. We like the, uh, we like the other gospel. We like the other spirit better. We don't like, we don't like this one. I wish that as watchmen we could change their mind. And in some cases we are. Keep help spreading the, the message, the gospel. Uh, draw people to this or other watchman type um, ministries. As long as they are following and sticking with the King James Bible. Draw people to them. Give them videos. Give them tracks. Whatever it is that you can do. Warn people because I can tell you I'm reading the emails from people. And I'm hearing the comments. They're calling me Pastor Mike. Um, my family member is coming out of the charismatic movement because of the DVDs that we gave him. Pastor Mike, uh, uh, my, my husband is no longer reading the NIV. He's reading the King James. Uh, Pastor Mike, we used to be uh, charismatic. We used to follow all this stuff. And then some things just didn't sound right to us. And we, we didn't know where to turn. And we saw on YouTube your video. We saw your website. And we saw what happened. And we thank God. And I thank God. For watchmen who helped stand. The watchman who sent me this video said, Pastor Mike, maybe you need to consider talking about this. And I'm talking about it. Because you need to be careful. Certain men crept in. How? They, they crept in unawares. Nobody saw them coming in. But now they're there. And many are following their pernicious ways. Warn people that you might save. Probably won't save everybody. But we might save some. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Paul warned us about this other gospel thing. He said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you an, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. See, that's what I said a while ago. It's, it's, if it's the opposite of the good news, it's not the good news. It's, it's the bad news. Okay, The bad news is you're going to go to hell. That's the bad news. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. How do you pervert the gospel of Christ? Uh, you take out 64,000 words out of the Bible. That's, that's a good start. okay? And then you stop referring to Jesus as the Son of Man. You, st you start referring to him as the human one. That's perverting the gospel. Uh, verse 8, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. Paul said, even if it's me, even if it's me, that shows up. And you know what people's problem is? They look at guys like Mike Bickle and they go, Oh, he's one of the holy prophets of God. Oh, he's, look at, he's up on the stage. Oh, he's hearing from God. What is he saying? What does God have to tell me? When they don't, they've forgotten or just don't care 
that they can read what God said right here. They don't need Mike Bickle. They don't need Todd Bentley. They don't need uh, Benny the Hen. They don't need these people to tell them what God said. Read it. And the Holy Ghost to tell them what God said. Though we an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Whew, strong language here. Let him be accursed. 2 Corinthians 11, for such are false apostles. This is the same chapter now that he is talking about another Jesus. He said, for such are false, false apostles. Now, uh, the, uh, they call this the New Apostolic Reformation, the NAR. These guys like Bickle and Bob Jones, um, uh, the Kansas City Prophets, and Todd the Bentley, uh, they are actually the new apostles. Okay? Um, they have a new message, a new gospel, a new thing, a new feeling. They, everything's new with them. Actually, the, you know, the Bible says there is no new thing under the sun. It's simply what they're doing is just the old junk that was in Babylon years ago. But he says such are false apostles. They're not the real ones. You, want how, you know how I know? Um, because the real ones are, are dead. Uh, Paul and James and, and Peter, and John, okay? They've already written their doctrine and they're, they're up in heaven now, okay? That's how I know these new guys are false. Um, uh, deceitful workers. That means they're lying through their teeth. And here is Mike Bickle saying, you're going you're gonna to say, well, this Jesus, I, I don't know who this is. See, he's trying to lie to you. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. See, that Todd Bentley and, and Mike Bickle, they don't come out and say, uh, we worship Satan. Let's all worship the devil. Let's worship the dragon. Come on. Okay. See, they're not going to do that. They're going to appear like Christians. They're going to be in, they're going to look like sheep. But they're not. They're wolves dressed up like sheep. And he says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing. If his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The things that they're doing, God's writing it all down. And they're going to have to give an account for it, as we all must. Make sure that your life, your doctrine, your beliefs, your faith is grounded and rooted in the word of God. Make sure it's here, right here, and not in men. We will be judged according to our works. Now, there's a false gospel everywhere. Um, if you remember, uh, several months ago, we came out with a video called The, the Mystery of Contemplative Prayer. If you don't have that video, uh, you need to get it. Look for it on YouTube. Look for it on our Watchman broadca WatchmanVideoBroadcast.com. Um, go to Google and type it in, The Mystery of Contemplative Prayer. Uh, and if you can't find it or you can't download it from the Internet, call our ministry, write us, and we'll send you a copy. You need to see this because I was, uh, I was pretty shocked. I was pretty shocked and amazed. And I'm going to say, um, I'm going to read you an article here that, that actually comes out in favor of a form of contemplative prayer. Although they don't call it that, but that's, that's what it is. And um, uh, shame, shame on WorldNet Daily for promoting this. Um, I used to use a lot of WorldNet Daily's um, articles. They had some good stuff about what was going on. Um, I, I, I can't go along with this, and neither should they. It's a deception. And they're going after the people that in this country we, we prize the most, we honor the most, and we should honor them. These are our soldiers. These are the men that are obeying the orders. They're obeying the orders of the commander-in-chief, whether they agree with them or not. They're, they're doing what they signed up to do. They're obeying the orders. Whatever the agenda is, they're going out and they're obeying the orders. They are putting their life on the line because that's what they agreed to do. Some of these soldiers lose their life, and they should be honored as they come back in this country. Don't worry about Westboro Baptist Church uh, throwing up picket signs everywhere. We should honor these men and their caskets when they come back into this country. We should salute them as they go down the road. I have a habit of, if I see someone that uh, is wearing a military uniform or anybody that has a crew cut or a Vietnam patch, I walk up to the mass and with my hand out, and I ask them, did you serve your country? 
And when they say yes, I say thank you for serving your country, for fighting to keep, to keep my children safe. I believe in that. But now the devil, he, he doesn't care about people. He's going after the combat soldiers, those that have fought in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. Those, um, I know some guys that were in Vietnam. Some talk about it, some don't. They don't say a word. Post-traumatic stress kicks in because of the things they saw and the things that they had to do. It's not normal for human beings to do that to other human beings in warfare or not. Uh, it's not normal. And so our soldiers come back and they're all, they, they, they've seen some things. They've had to do some things. They watch kids with bombs blow themselves up, just like they did in Vietnam. They watched that in horror. They saw things. They had to do things that just to stay alive. And they come back, and they're a little messed up for that. And I think there's ways that can be helped. And we know that God said he sent his word and healed them. We, we believe in that. But now there's something new that's coming out, and it's as dangerous it's as dangerous as a grenade in the hands of a little child. Here's the article from World Net Daily. Military praises fantastic new post-traumatic stress therapy. This is from World Net Daily. For the American soldier, it's become the sneakiest of all sneak attacks to watch out for. The enemy's final chance to wreak havoc by secretly following the soldier home and attacking him and his loved ones there. Post-traumatic stress disorder, frequently characterized as bringing the enemy home with you, has become an epidemic in the U.S. military. But because of a dramatic breakthrough from the grassroots, there is new hope. The problem is dire, exacerbated by back-to-back -back tours of a duty and war environment where enemy combatants are often... Um, indistinguishable from civilians and every passing vehicle a potential car bomb up to 20 percent of iraq and afghanistan war vets are currently struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder but now they got a new thing fortunately a new technique for coping with ptsd and other stress-related syndromes involving neither drugs nor in many cases even the psychiatrist's couch is now spreading rapidly throughout the various service branches. Although it is proliferated among, almost entirely by word of mouth, given to soldiers and family members by psychologists, nurses, military chaplains, fellow soldiers, and senior officers, its simplicity, privacy, and remarkable track record are being noticed at the highest levels. In my own experience as a commander who mobilized and returned thousands of wartime veterans, I have seen soldiers make rapid improvement through the use of CDs, said Major General George R. Harris. CDs? Help for a serious condition like post-traumatic stress disorder just from listening to a compact disc? Really? Harris, a recently retired West Point general assigned to the office of the Secretary of the Army, is indeed talking about a single compact disc playable on any CD player or computer titled Coping Strategies. Distributed to the military by a 501c3 nonprofit called Patriot Outreach. The CD, which helps users overcome the negative effects of stress, is sent free upon request to military service personnel, veterans, and their families, and also made available to the general public at a nominal cost, which in turn helps pay for the manufacturing and free distrib distribution uh, to military families. Here is the CD. It's called Coping uh, Strategies. And it's the audio program called, here we go, be still and know. Stop right here. Where have we seen that before? Be still and know. If you don't recognize that, I'm going to show you where that comes from here in a little bit. But anyway, it's a state-of-the-art mindfulness exercise. Stop right here. Brain exercises. Okay, They're dealing with the brain. And it's called Be Still and Know. And, and what does it have to do with? I went to the company, patriotoutreach.org. And uh, here's their website, Be Still and Know Exercise, Coping Strategies, Requests, and blah, blah, blah. Here is, here's the, the, the guy that puts this out. His name is Roy Masters. And his website says, more than a talk host, Roy Masters is also a listen host. From Miami to Los Angeles, his show has touched and brought life-changing courage to millions, including such diversely famous fans as the late John Wayne and Internet journalist Matt Drudge. Roy speaks with the enchanting accent of his British boyhood and with the crystal clarity and flashing brilliance of the diamonds he polished as a young craftsman. Early on, he studied hypnosis used it to help people overcome their problems, was arrested in Houston for diagnosing without a license, 
boy, they, I don't know, just, you know, red flag sticking up here, and made headlines when during a few days in jail, he, he had hardened cellmates to change their minds and hearts away from crime. H- how did he do this? He has an organization called the Foundation of Human Understanding Worldwide, and the Be Still and No CD is based upon a CD called Meditation, a simple awareness exercise for overcoming stress and illness. Meditation. Here, here's, here's what it is. Meditation. Um, in fact, let me, uh, let, me, let me do this. Let me, let, me go, let me go to the book here. Uh, because some people get a little confused when I say the word meditation. They say, well, doesn't the Bible tell us to think and meditate on these things? And uh, it doesn't the, the Bible say in Psalm 1, um, uh, he, he loves the law, and in his law doth he meditate day and night? Yes, it says that. Christian biblical meditation involves reading the Scripture and thinking on the Scripture, thinking about it, Okay. The, ob- the obverse or the, uh, the opposite of that is taking a portion of Scripture or something, a small phrase or word, and emptying everything else out of your mind and going and repeating it over and over and over again. And Jesus said, please, whatever you do, don't follow the ways of the heathen. Don't, don't do what the heathen are doing by having vain repetitions. Don't, wh- whatever you do, don't do that. By the way, that... Um, that's what you hear in the bowl and worship music. And a lot of the praise and worship bowl and, what was that, um, bowl and harp music. And the praise and worship music, it's repetitive over and 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 over. Just the way someone would put somebody into hypnosis. Here in Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise. There's eight things here. Eight is the number for renewing. Okay, If there be any praise, think on these things. Sobriety means having your mind alert and full of thoughts and actions and activities. The opposite of that is this deep trance meditation where you empty everything out of your mind. Get it out of there. Okay? And fall into a near sleep. And they say that this brings a calm. And, and oh, by the way, in this meditation, you're going to, um, you're going to hear a voice. And that voice is God within you. It's, he's like in here, inside you. I want you to remember that I said that. Okay? Remember that I said that. Mike Bickle's teaching us about another Jesus. And hear this meditative practice for these soldiers. Who they say, oh, it's working. Oh, it's working so well. I've just got rid of all my stress. And, and now I'm just, I'm happy all the time. Okay? Um, wow. By going into a trance and... And hearing a voice on the inside of you and feeling these feelings, that's, a, that's another spirit. The CD title that there's, this company is putting out is called Be Still and Know. That actually comes from a portion of Scripture in Psalm 46.10 that says, Be still and know that I am God. Now, that's God talking. But you see, it's kind of turned around. There was part of this contemplative prayer package came out called Be Still and Know That I Am God. It's you know supported by Henry Cloud, Max Lucado, Beth Moore, Richard Foster. All of these are contemplatives. These are people who actually go into trances and they have God speak to them from the inside of them. They hear the voices of the spirits talking to them and they're being told that that's God on the inside of them. And this video, Be Still and Know, is actually sold in Christianity to church people, being promoted by pastors and Christian websites. Oh, you got to get, this is, this is like a new prayer thing, okay? It's, it's not like, you know, praying, dear God, please get, that's not it. It's uh, om, om, and repetitive over and over. Lectio Divina, the Jesus prayer where you rec- recite scripture over and over and over again until you lull your mind down to a near sleep. Go get our video on contemplative prayer. You'll understand it. A new age guru by the name of Deepak Chopra. I've seen this guy. He is nuts. Okay, He is full of familiar spirits. This is actually a quote 
um, that he actually quoted the phrase, be still and know that I'm God. Look what he says about this phrase. This is from Lighthouse Trails Research. Um, I think this is with Larry King. Larry King says, what's the first step toward knowing him, which is God or her or it? Chopper says, the first step is the ability to sit down quietly, close your eyes and do nothing and listen to the silence within you. Hmm. As the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, which literally means if you go in the gap within your thoughts, which is the window to your soul, you start to eavesdrop on the cosmic mind. King said, that's an Eastern concept, but how do you, uh, how, uh, but how, do you to, how do you do that when so many things get in the way? Chopper said, you just have to sit down and take the time, and if you do it on a regular basis, becomes very profound. It's a learned ability. I taught my children to do this when they were four years of age, and they've actually uh, they've actually been extraordinary children because they have grounded and centered from four four years old and onward. He actually says that this phrase, "Be still and know that I'm God," is actually being used as a window to uh, to open the window up, to get in the gaps between your thoughts. Okay, the breach is what that is. The breach between your thoughts. The, the your thoughts are the um, are the wall. The firewall, the protection of sobriety. As long as you're sober, you're thinking. And as long as you're thinking, you're sober. But Chopper actually says that this is a way of getting in that little gap there. So we can sneak the God in. that's already within us. Are you, are you catching this? This is being given away to our soldiers. Promoted by World Net Daily Abbott. I have a huge problem with that. Shame on them. The breach between their thoughts, which is your firewall, your protection against what the devil wants to do with you. What does he want to do with you? That's spelled out in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 6. God said, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee. That's, that's, by the way, that's a conspiracy. When you got more than one person sitting down saying, hey, we need to get this guy. That's a conspiracy. And here we have Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah. These are actually indicative of spirits who are conspiring. They have taken evil counsel against these, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it. Did you catch that? Did you catch that? See, I already have a king. His name is Jesus Christ. Okay? The son of David, the son of God. I have a king already. There's a conspiracy against me. There's a conspiracy against you. There's a conspiracy against our soldiers, our pastors, our presidents, our leaders. There's a conspiracy against them to get in the gap between their thoughts. Okay? And they can't really get in there unless, of course, you uh, open the window open the gap up a little bit. Then they want to they want to cause a breach so that they can come in and set a king in the midst of your city, in the midst of your kingdom. It won't be Jesus Christ. It'll be the other Christ, okay? Um a breach. Picture pic The antidote to this is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Wherefore gird up The loins of your mind. In other words, tighten it all up. Get it all good and together here. Gird up the loins of your mind. What did Paul say about uh, having your loins gird about with truth? Scripture's right here. You know when Paul was talking about, you know, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, King James Bible. Whatsoever things are, 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 are just, King James Bible. Whatsoever things are honest, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, pray... King James Bible. You know how to you know how to gird up the loins of your mind? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read it some more. Read another chapter. Read about two or three chapters a day. Read the scriptures often. Girding up the loins. Having your loins gird about with truth. Thy word is truth, Jesus said. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Not drunk. Not Mike Bickle drunk. Not Todd Bentley drunk. Okay? Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think, I, think it's, I think it's going to be so obvious when Jesus comes back who's his and who's not. Because all those that are Christ are sober. All those that are not Christ are drunk. 
And when you go into a place, it's pretty easy to tell who is and who isn't. Uh, somebody sent me this video. It just all kind of fit in this week. I was putting it together and just all kind of worked itself in together this week. Um, a new video game coming out. I used to play a lot of video games. I, I don't. Every now and then I'll play solitaire on my, on my iPad or something. Um, but these new video games are coming out. This one is called Deus Ex. Now, wait till you, unless you know Latin, wait till you hear what this means. Deus Ex, wait till you hear what this means. But you see the little symbolism here. This is a screen cap, crack capture I did of the video. I'm going to show you the whole video. Um, it's about the singularity. Okay? Watch, see the symbolism of the pyramid and, and all that. You, you get that, okay? And it's on a stack of books. And I mean, there's just so many things here. But I want you to watch this, this trailer for this new video game that's coming out called Deus Ex uh, Evolution. Revolution. Take a look. I'm faster than you. I'm stronger than you. Certainly, I will last much longer than you. You may think I am the future, but you're wrong. You are. If I had a wish, I'd wish to be human. To know how it feels. To feel hope, to despair, to wonder, to love. I can achieve immortality by not wearing out. You can achieve immortality simply by doing one great thing. You may think that I am the future, but I'm not. You are. Deus ex means God within. Are we seeing a pattern here? Are we seeing something emerging, rising up? Are we seeing that we're very, very, very rapidly approaching a day when people are going to be led to believe that God has actually been inside them the whole time and He needs, he needs to be let out, He needs to be released. Release the anointing. Release. We need to have the key that opens the gate to releasing the God within us. Listen for these things. You're going to hear it in advertising. Uh, you're going to hear it, see, see it in TV commercials, TV shows, music, country, rock, pop. You're going to see it in books, comic books, magazines, video games, movies. You're going to see it everywhere. We're being flooded with these images. Okay? Unawares. Certain men crept in unawares. Okay? They're coming in through the little gap that's been made in there. Uh, the God within. I, f I saw a book um, put out by a guy called The Genie of Your Genes. Okay? And it's actually basically saying that you have the ability to manipulate and control and, and do something even with your own DNA. And this author is a New Age author, and he says you've got like a genie. And it, do you know, do you know what a genie is? You know what it is, okay? It's a, it's a devil. It's a spirit, okay? It, in fact, it's more than that. A genie, go look this up. A genie is a is a hybrid spirit, okay? And you've got one in your in your DNA. It's all closed up, okay? Um, something needs to open it up and release it. Um, they're going to work on this. Um, we see it in the occult realm. We see it in the church. We see it in... I mean, we see it everywhere. Then, somebody sent me this. Said, Pastor Mike, get a hold of this. The scientific realm. Remember, you have the God within you. The Deus Ex 
thing says. And it's about the singularity, about men becoming gods one of these days and being stronger and faster and, 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 and immortal, living forever, which means that we need to kill off all of the diseases. We need to get rid of uh, all the bad diseases that are killing us right now. And so you have the genetic scientists working on it. You have the medical scientists working on it. You have the biologists. You have the physicists and the electronic engineers. You have, even have software companies working on this thing. Uh, and one, one group at, at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, at their Lincoln Laboratory, look at this, researchers develop a technique to cure a broad range of viruses. Now stop right here. Okay? Do you know what a virus is? A virus is nothing more than just a little strand of DNA that gets inside you that does, I mean, nasty stuff to you. Okay, Like a virus can get in you and you can have the flu and you feel terrible and you ache all over and you just snot and everything like that or you can get a virus you know like you know down you know below your stomach and eh, that's bad okay uh, but that a virus is like uh, ebola ebola you know what ebola is you get the ebola virus and like you're dead in two days i mean you just bleed out everywhere it's terrible ebola is a virus but a virus aids is a virus and it's just a little strand of really weird, bad DNA. Okay, it's, it's bad. So the, um, the researchers develop a technique to, cu to cure <clears throat> these, these viruses. Viral pathogens pose serious health threats worldwide for clinical viruses such as HIV or hepatitis, emerging viruses such as avian or swine influenza, and highly lethal viruses such as Ebola or smallpox that might be used in bioterrorist attacks. Relatively few therapeutics or prophylactics, which is pre preventatives, exist. Most therapeutics that do exist are highly specific for one virus, are ineffective against virus strains that become resistant to them, or have adverse effects on patients. As part of the panacea, yeah. Hmm. Has the name Pan in it, which was the god that was half goat and half human. So I'd throw that in there. Panacea, uh, which stands for pharmacological augmentation of nonspecific antipathogen cellular enzymes and activities. <sighs> Project. Researchers from MIT Lincoln Laboratory have developed and demonstrated a novel broad spectrum antiviral approach called Draco. Double stranded RNA. Activated capsase oligomerizer. Draco selectively induces apoptosis or cell suicide in cells containing any viral uh, dsRNA, rapidly killing infected cells without harming uninfected cells. Draco is the cure now for viruses, AIDS, Ebola, the flu, the cold, all of that stuff. Draco now is it's the cure. Okay. Do you know you know who Draco is, don't you? Okay. Um, there is I love this. There is a constellation in the northern sky. It actually it, it gives the appearance of circling the the northern star, the pole star, uh, Polaris. Okay. A, sort of winding around it. It's the constellation called Draco, and it's always in the northern sky. It's always up. It's always up north. Okay. And I like I like this. I like this because when you walk into the tabernacle. Um, you walk in, and there on the left, on the, on the south, God was pretty specific about this stuff. On the south, you have the menorah. You have the seven candlesticks, which is the Holy Spirit. Up here on the north, oh, I like this. Up here on the north was a table. Okay? Nice, pretty gold table. And on this table were 12 hot, fresh loaves of bread sitting there. Priests made the bread every day, brand new bread every day. They don't, they don't like that stale, moldy bread, huh? And this was brand new every day. It's like the mercies of God, which are new every day. And uh, anyway, here's the table of showbread. Twelve loaves, twelve for the promise of God. The bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread. I'm that bread. That, that's me, Okay. And I'm fresh every day. I'm new every day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Here's the bread. And it's on a table. And it's on the north. And David said in Psalm 23, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. 
Draco up in, up in the north. In other words, right in front of our enemies, Jesus says, come and dine. Come and dine with me. I got it. I, I got you taken care of here. Draco is the dragon. And now they're saying that Draco, the dragon, is, is going to be the cure. Um, Fat Albert Pike here uh, in Morals and Dogman. Um, Fat Albert Pike uh, talks about the great work. Okay, um, the uh, the grand arcanum, and he's, he he equates it as the the divine speck or the divine powder, divine God, the the Deus within us, the divine powder that can cure all human maladies and diseases. Actually, basically saying this is what's going to make man live forever. You know, Freemasonry is based a lot upon Rosicrucianism. Rosicrucianism basically says. Um, Rosicrucian is all about man's evolution and how he's going to change from just being a mortal to a god. Genesis chapter 3, ye shall be as God. And who said that? Who said ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil? Um, the serpent, the, the dragon said that. There is a character in all of the uh, mythology. Uh, Pike talks about him. Dan Brown talks about him. Uh, Manley Hall talks about him. Now, I have a quote here from Manley Hall's book, um, Secret Teachings of All Ages. And he says that there's a guy by the name of Hermes Trismegistus, which means three times majestic. I want, I want you to think of um, the number three. Okay? One, two, three. Three. Here's your two-strand DNA, and here's the third here. So this is actually a picture of Hermes Trismegistic. Okay, three-strand DNA, the triple helix, a adding something to man's DNA. Let's let's change it and mix it all up so that it's, it's actually cures all of his diseases. And Hermes actually, um, and I, I have this theory that Hermes is actually the Antichrist because Hermes is dead and buried, and so is his book. And it's going to be found one of these days. It's going to be unlocked and released, and all. So I, I, I get that. But Hermes actually was given his power. Are, are, are you, you're going to you're going to like this. Hermes was given his calling and his divine secrets and his magic and everything else that he had um, by an ent entity that he called the Poimander. He actually wrote a book called The Divine Pymander. Um, Poimander. And I'm going to show you from Manley Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, who the Poimander is. Okay, look at this. Here's what Manley Hall says. Hermes, while wandering in a rocky and desolate place, gave himself over to meditation and prayer. Here we stop. Stop, 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 stop. Meditation. Okay, are, are you kidding me? The exact same thing that we're seeing flooding into the church right now. That and our soldiers. That's what Hermes did. Emptied his mind, chanted, went into a trance. He gave himself over to that. He says, following the secret instructions of the temple, he gradually freed his higher consciousness, which means he shut off his brain okay, uh, from the bondage of his bodily senses and thus released his divine nature, revealed to him the mysteries of the transcendental spheres. He beheld a figure terrible and awe-inspiring. It was the great dragon with wings stretching across the sky and light streaming in all directions from its body. Stop right here. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's what the Bible says. The great dragon with rings stretching across the sky and light streaming in all directions from his body. The mysteries taught that the universal life was personified as a dragon. The great dragon called Hermes by name and uh, called Hermes by name and asked him why he thus meditated upon the world mystery. Terrified by the spectacle, Hermes prostrated himself before the dragon, beseeching it to reveal its identity. The great creature answered that it was Poimandries, the mind of the universe, the creative intelligence and absolute emperor of all. Manley Hall says, Sure identifies Poimanders as the god Osiris. So, you now know who Osiris is, right? It's the dragon. Okay, that's, that's who that is. Um, let me show you something else that, that Manley Hall says that Hermes found out about from 
Osiris, the great dragon who has light emanating from him. The name Lucifer sort of falls in with this, okay, light bearer. Uh, Manley Hall says, the dragon says, of the immortal man, stop right here, the immortal man now is going to be the God man, the, the new breed that Joel's army talks about. It's going to be the, the gods that the dragon, the serpent promised Eve that all mankind would be one of these days. Or you're going to be gods now. Just hold on tight and do what we say. And, and it's, it, it's, the secret is hidden somewhere. Wait, wait till you find out. Uh, Dan Brown points out in the lost symbol. And I got it. When I read it, I got it. The Masonic symbol of Washington's Monument talks about the elevation of man. Washington's Monument is a, is a giant obelisk. It's actually the phallus of Osiris. There's that dragon again. Buried down in the base of the Washington Monument. Okay? Hidden in a crypt. Way, way, way down underneath the earth. It's going to wait to be revealed one of these days. Is a King James Bible. Okay? The DNA of man. And they're, they're teaching you that the, the, the uh, Hermes and his wonderful magical lost word that's going to heal everybody, make everybody gods, is actually buried down there. It's down within something buried. Okay? Look at what the dragon told Hermes. Of the immortal man, it should be said that he is hermaphrodite or male and female. Stop right here. I keep stopping because I, I have to get through this. Hermaphrodite, that is, remember, that's Baphomet. The male and female God that Kenneth Copeland worships. Kenneth Copeland comes out and says, um, God made Adam both male and female like God is both male and female. That's what Kenneth Copeland said. Now, Kenneth Copeland did not read that in the King James Bible. He did not read that in the Scriptures. I wonder what spirit told Kenneth Copeland that the God that he was worshiping was both male and female and that man also was going to be like that. I wonder what spirit told him that. Let's go back to what the poimandras said, the dragon said. Of the immortal man, it should be said that he is hermaphrodite or male and female and eternally watchful. He neither slumbers nor sleeps and is governed by a father, also both male and female and ever watchful. Such is the mystery kept hidden to this day for nature being mingled in marriage with the sky man. That's the sons of God and daughters of men. Do you remember star man? Okay. The sky man brought forth a wonder most wonderful. Seven men, all bisexual, male and female and upright of stature. Stop right here. Doesn't it make you wonder why God said in the book of Deuteronomy, their vine is the vine of Sodom. Sodomy and homosexuality and transgenderism is all about combining the male and the female into, into one body. That spirit is just exploding all over the world right now. It's not the Holy Spirit of God. It's, a, it's, it's the dragon. Brought forth a wonder most wonderful, seven men, all bisexual, male and female, and upright of stature, each one exemplifying the natures of the seven governors. These, O Hermes, are the seven races, species, and wheels. Then he says, Then Hermes desired to know why men should be deprived of immortality for the sin of ignorance alone. The great dragon answered, To the ignorant the body is supreme, and they are incapable of realizing the immortality that is within them. The hidden immortality that is in them. Did you catch that? The 46 words that the dragon, the devil, spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, the words that he said, the 46 of them in the King James Bible, 46 chromosomes, he planted a seed in her. Okay? Not by copulating with her, by speaking, his words going into her, planted a seed in her. And we are all the children of Eve, and we all have that within us. Paul described it this way. Romans chapter 7, verse 17. Now then, it is no more that I did do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth, look what he, look what he calls it. 
He calls it no good thing. Paul says that there's something called sin, something called no good thing that is dwelling in me right now. And Paul says, I got to get rid of this body. I cannot let this thing live and I don't want what's dwelling within me to come out. But everything else out there, contemplative prayer and this CD called Be Still and Know That I Am God and all of the mystery societies and all the everything is bringing us to this pinnacle point where the key is going to unlock the gate and he is coming out. Are you following with me here? Okay. Uh, think of things. Uh, Joel, Joel uh, Osteen calls it the champion that is in you. There was actually a book, uh, one of these you know positive thinking, new age quote type of Christianity books written to talk about the champion that is in you. And I, I don't know if you remember this or not, but you can search the King James Bible. You'll find the word champion in there all right. The champion is Goliath, who is as a lion and a bear, David said. And he's got sixes all over him. I wonder who the champion that Joel Osteen says is within you that you need to discover. PNC Bank, the little triple helix logo, PNC PNC Bank is, has a new advertising scheme called Discover the Achiever in You. Bring out the achiever in you. He's, he's in there. And through the little triple helix logo, we're going we're gonna to bring him out. You need to discover that. Joel Osteen and all of these other people, they're, they're trying to get you to discover this thing that is in you. Deuteronomy 32, verse 32, there it is. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is, look at here, the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. The dragon is not going to heal you. And the Draco thing that the MIT researchers are working on, that's not going to, that's not going to fix your problems. It's, it's going to make it worse. It's, not, it's, it's, like the, it's like the gospel. It's not really the good news. It's the bad news. The bad news is if you partake of this thing, if you drink of this wine, you're going to die. That's the bad news. You see, because their vine is not as our vine. It's not the same thing and it won't bring eternal life. Jerusalem, uh, Jeremiah, oh, look at this. I like this. Jeremiah 9 11. And I will make Jerusalem heaps, a den of dragons, and I will make the cities of Judah desolate without inhabitant. Jeremiah 10 22. Behold, the noise of the brute is come and a great commotion out of the north country. That's where Draco is, by the way, to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. See, the answer is all right here in scriptures. It's telling you, here Jesus prepares a table for us right in the presence on the north side, right in the presence of our enemies where the dragons are going to come from. And Judah is the, is the, the, uh, the, the fourth tribe of Israel. Judah and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of God. Jerusalem represents, represents you. Represents the churches right now. Represents wherever God used to be. And Jerusalem, instead of being the city of God, is going to be the habitation of, of dragons. They're actually going to live here inside the temple. Okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 13. This is all about this dragon. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. There's your Joel's army there. And notice that what the dragon did for the beast. It gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Who, who's able to do that? The dragon. It's all about worshipping the dragon, the serpent. But not the the dragon and the beast. They represent not the gospel and not the spirit that Paul gave and not the Jesus that he preached. It's another one. And it's all being done by words. Remember, Satan didn't really like have you know a thing with Eve. He spoke to her. Okay. He spoke, he conceived in her mind this thought 
of disobeying God. And that seed is still there. We all have it in us, don't we? Okay? Dragons speaking. This false prophet, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, notice what it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell, dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was, was healed. He speaks as a dragon. You remember earlier we saw the logo, the symbol of uh, Mike Bickle and his other Jesus, and it matched the dragon naturally speaking symbol. The, they're speaking as a dragon. The dragon, the serpent, the devil spoke in the Garden of Eden, and he wanted, he wanted Eve to have a new birth. Okay? There's going to be a, two types of being born again. Which one are you going to have? First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, the dragon speaks, everybody's listening. They're going to be born again of corruptible seed and born into corruption. Whereas when God speaks in the incorruptible, undefiled word, his word gives us life and immortality and Godhood. We share the inheritance with his son, Jesus Christ, all of us being sons of God. Because we were not born again of corruptible seed. Pay attention to the times we're living in. We're, we're moving Moving forward rapidly. Got a lot of things going. Our website keeps getting hacked. Pray for us there. We think we think maybe we're kind of being targeted. Maybe something that we're doing. I don't know. But anyway, pray for our pray for our ministry. Uh, if you'd like to support us uh, every month, one time, whatever. Hey, praise the Lord for that. We appreciate that. Um, you can see us at WatchmanVideoBroadcast.com. You can see us at PureBibleStudy.com. Visit BethelChurch.com. Uh, a one-hour live broadcast every Tuesday and Thursday called Pastor Mike Online at PastorMikeOnline.com. That's a live broadcast every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, we just want to get the truth out. And we want people to be watchers and warn people about what's coming in the last days. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We will see you the next time. Bye-bye.